And our next speaker is Boris Djordjev. Djordjevic. And uh, he's from 199 Biotechnologies. Okay, so first I want to thank everyone for, um, well, for, it's, it's a wonderful conference and uh, I'm so happy to be here. I was here last year and uh, I want to thank the team at RDD for allowing me to do this speech. And the first thing which, which strikes me as odd is that last year I saw much less hair on your, on your head and probably a bit grayer. So I'm not sure what you're working on, but it seems to be working. Okay, so the... Um, Vittorio has done a very good talk, and uh, I kind of wanted to talk about the same thing, but then uh, you had so many good talks about uh, epigenetic reprogramming that I will skip that part, although it's one of the things that we do, maybe the main thing. And I want to talk to you about breaking through longevity barriers. Now, a barrier, as you know, is something that prevents someone or something from going to one place, from one place to another. And um, the first barrier, I will call it a cognitive barrier. When I was um, maybe 20, 20, 20 or so years ago, there, uh, I found a very interesting book, Relativity, from Albert Einstein. He wrote it for people to understand what he did. Uh, I started reading and so far I haven't finished yet. But what stuck me in the first chapter is um, how, I mean, you all know that he's uh, quite a rebel. He was not very conformist. And um, he, what struck me is really how he decided to challenge the accepted notions at that time, for example, in mathematics or geometry, about the nature of a straight line between two points. And by redefining some of those key concepts, he has been able to come up with a theory of the relativity. Maybe that's a very, very, very oversimplified version of it, but uh, this idea of redefining, this idea of re-examining what we know is still at the core of science. And um, maybe, if we challenge some accepted notions that we have, which is, I mean, which I hope that you all do as in this field of aging is already quite, um, I would say, non-conformist or rebel, a little bit rebel. So um, this, might be, this might be really the way to go forward. And uh, if you remember what Aichan said, he said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I'm not looking at anyone. <laughs> so. The second barrier that I want to talk is inefficiency. And for that, I will tell you a little bit my own story. Uh, about 20 or so years ago, I started doing medicine and uh, I had the misfortune of meeting a guy with a long beard, a very strange guy. I think he was here a few minutes ago. I'm not sure if he's still here. Uh, you all know him. And uh, well, I decided to not do medicine and instead I um, thought about doing science. But then I also had the misfortune of seeing what scientists actually do when they begin their career. And I thought that didn't seem very glamorous. So I decided to become an entrepreneur. And uh, at that time, you couldn't be a YouTuber, otherwise I'd for sure be a YouTuber. So I wrote a few ideas on a piece of paper, like any good entrepreneur. I bought a ticket to the fastest growing economy in the world, China. And uh, I flew there and, well, I learned quite a few things. Some, uh, some, I had some successes, some things didn't turn out very well. But um, what I learned to value is speed, is efficiency, is being creative and able to achieve in a creative way your results. And uh, often, we like to make everything complicated. The academia world is a very large world it, and people like to do things a certain way. But sometimes when we want to achieve something, we can, we can, uh, we can achieve those with very little resources, which is why, you have, why, why the stories about uh, rags to riches are so inspiring. So the, um, like, any, uh, like all these skill set and all these, um, all these ideas is something that we implemented in our company that we started just this year. And um, like in any business, the end point is to get things to work. And um, as someone in aging research, we want to solve aging. And um, I think in that regard, clinical significance is much more important than the statistical significance. And I want to thank Bianca for coming up with that. So um, the third barrier that I want to talk about is over-specialization and being disconnected. So there is, um, there is another book written about 80 years ago, and uh, I found it strangely, very, very strangely relevant, um, especially now. 
it, it is by Erwin Schrodinger in Dublin. He wrote about, uh, well, he called the book The Meaning of Life. And that book led actually to a few things such as the, uh, at least the discovery of the DNA or kind of was very, very well connected and inspired many researchers to, to develop the molecular biology as we know it. But in the preface of that book, the very interesting thing is he wrote about scientists at that time, in the 1940s, already being disconnected from the big picture by being over-specialized in their field. And I don't think that thing has changed much since. I, I think it has, it has got, gotten worse. We are very over-specialized. And we, I think as scientists, we ought, to not, we ought to keep our mind open to um, other fields, even at a very basic level, to build a model of understanding, to be able to predict things without having those very specialized models. I mean, our brain is, was specially made to be able to predict, to be able to take things using a simple model and um, come, out, come out with complex answers, much like ChatGPT. And until the time where the AI takes over what we do, I think in 10 or, 10 or 15 years from now on, we can still, we still have to um, really connect everything that we know. And there is so much about aging research, about the hallmarks of aging, about understanding the foundation of diseases. Or if I use Einstein's idea, we could really find some diseases, actual symptoms, rather than, di than diseases themselves. Uh, and we can use this idea to, um, to advance and make breakthrough. So how we implemented that in our company, we decided to um, connect different fields from the molecular to um, to the cellular level, from the cellular level to the tissue level. And uh, we did that in microfluidic models so that we can test and we can have a reliable way to examine, uh, to examine and um, gather data. So the first model that we developed, in, uh, that we developed is um, just, uh, the, why the microfluidics first? The microfluidics is a very controlled environment in three dimension. It allows us to do live, uh, live imaging. We can measure the mechanical properties. We can do pretty much any kind of test that you can think of. And it is high throughput. And it's at least uh, the reliability depends much on the engineering skill set to develop those models. So it's more of an engineering problem in terms of how good you can make it. And uh, you have potential to work on a multitude of tissues. So the first thing that we did is we developed a model of microvasculature. And um, it's a self-assembled microvasculature network. The, the functions is very similar to um, what we can see in vivo in terms of per uh, perfusibility, permeability, the mechanical integrity is very, very similar to many tissues that we have observed in mice, even in humans. And uh, as you, uh, you can see that um, you can see different types of cell. Uh, in, in, in this model, we combined, for example, the, the human umbilical vein endothelial cells, the, the Huvex cells, the, and fibroblasts. And by, uh, by creating the right environment, providing the right cues, and uh, we've been able to grow those fully functioning small vessels, this microvasculature. And microvasculature, as some of you may know, is very relevant in many diseases. For example, in Alzheimer disease, it is one of the changes that happen mechanically as we age. We lo the vessels lose their permeability. They tend to break down. They tend to well, not work as they should. And um, it might be maybe a bit downstream of the hallmarks of aging, but then it is a very good way to observe what we do and any intervention that we try to develop. So we did an experiment and, and um, well, we're doing actually hundreds of experiments. We're testing hundreds, hundreds of compounds that can halt this decline in, um, in, in tissues, but also reverse potentially the, the, phen the, phenotype, the aging phenotype in those cells. And uh, we are testing from uh, partial reprogramming to senolytics, to autophagy. And um, I think I forgot to show you the perf perfusion video. It, you can see in young cells, it's fairly reliable. There is very little leakage. And um, the next model that we developed to further on that, um, 
that specific type of cell. So we added a few extra cells. We added astrocytes and pericytes, and we developed a model of the blood-brain barrier. So it's a model that can, where we can look at aging, at Alzheimer's disease, and other neuropathologies, but also allows us to screen for the CNS drug delivery. So we can look at which drugs can go through, the, through this barrier. The, um, the model ha has a very high degree of fidelity, so very good bio degree of biomimicry, and uh, so it's very relevant for human stu studies. And it, the, um, in terms of um, the cells, the cell, by providing the right cues and the right environment, the cells will form exactly as they form in vivo. So in terms of um, accuracy, it's a very, very reliable model. And to go even a bit further, we use nanofabrication technology and photolithography, so much like uh, how CPUs are built. We build micropillar models that allow us to um, basically grow the, to, to observe the myelination, myelination process. So we have oligodendrocytes, and we can see this. Um, I think I will go direct to the next slide. So as, as you can see here, we have this uh, very, um, this myelin sheath which is forming. You have a multitude of wraps, so a very good degree of fidelity. And these, um, I mean, the myelination is one of the first thing that begins to, that is affected by aging in, in many, many diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, and um, from, from there, like, our takeaway is that by combining different fields from biomechanics, from uh, tissue engineering, molecular biology, genetics, we, we, we are able to gather much more data, but also understand things from a different angle. And um, for, there is something that I propose is uh, the mechanical hallmarks of aging. Um, that might have been potentially overlooked. In, in, um, you can see in the picture, so we looked at the hippocampus and uh, we saw how it changed in the wild type mice. So the hippocampus uh, stiffness and elasticity modulus has been changing. I mean, you have this change that comes with aging, so we've been able to measure using uh, uh, the, the, AT, the AFM, the Atomic Force Microscope, we can measure the inattention of a single cell. And uh, these high resolution techniques and new machineries are, have, been very, have been used very sparingly in the context of aging research, and maybe that's something that, may, that might be interesting to combine and look at things from different angles. So, the, um, we, we did a lot of publication, especially regarding the, the cancer, the cancer exervization, the, the vascular morphogenesis. And the next thing I want to talk is about reprogramming. And okay, I think we have a problem here. So uh, I'm sure that many of you have had this problem. And usually when you try to reboot a computer and you keep getting that problem, what do you do, for example? Was the, was the only solution except getting a new computer at the apps, Apple Store? Or, yes, that, that, that's a good way. But another, another thing you tend to do is just type format C two dots. And uh, you want to reformat a drive because it doesn't change the components in the computer. Sure, you start from nothing, but you get a fully functional computer, minus a few glitches or a few broken clusters in the hard drive and so on. So I like, I like this metaphor for partial reprogramming because in essence, you rejuvenate the cells to the, very, to the very base, but I won't say much because we have so many good speakers and I don't want to take any, away anything from them. Uh, we are, as I said, we are a company we just started this year, so we have a lot of exciting things coming on, but all of that has been possible through uh, our amazing team, which uh, is still growing. We have good advisors and we have uh, very amazing people. And uh, if you want to contact us, if you want to learn more about the microfluidic models or cooperations, or if you want to join our team because we are actively recruiting, feel free to join us. And I wasn't too long. Okay, perfect. So you are in time for lunch. Do you... okay. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do we have a question? Maybe I can well, ask. I think I can ask. Are you open for academic collaborations? Yes, yes. We are definitely open for collaboration. Our goal is to advance the aging field. We opened the company not to make a patent and try to raise money. We opened the company because we really want to bring the results in the field of aging. And um, like I said, having a bootstrapping and entrepreneurial attitude is something that can help get results quickly, like in any business. But I think that's something that we need in aging. Okay.
Okay. Thanks again, and also thanks for sponsoring. And we're